Good morning, good morning family. As you can tell, I love, love life. I film anything and everything moving around, whether it's insects, birds, humans, and anything that has life in it. So this morning, I want you to join me on a trip to our local church while we talk about matters, religion, and returnees. I recognize that this might be uh, slightly sensitive for some folks. And so if you're one person who gets triggered, when people disagree with you on religious matters, please watch this video on mute. I don't want you going off and uh, throwing rocks at me for simply disagreeing with you with, with me. So please watch this on mute if you get triggered. Now, a lot of us are raised in ultra-religious uh, communities, whether it's Muslim, Christian, and other religious group. And when I use the term ultra-religious, uh, I mean... This experience where we have a fervent commitment to religion or religious practices without questioning, whether it comes to donating our resources, uh, religious ceremonies, or following leaders of all kinds. Just everything and anything religion without question. That's what I'm talking about here. Now, as we move from home to diaspora, a lot of us actually carry these practices and spiritual experiences into diaspora. In fact, I've seen many folks who arrive in diaspora, start churches, or even take leadership roles and do fairly well. For others, things change and change quite a bit. And so it, they change so much so that when we come back, we come back very different humans. And so I will discuss this topic simply uh, to present what I have observed uh, so that I hope that uh, folks may be able to understand uh, returnees who may look and act very different than they left, especially folks who've been gone for a while. So as I always mention in my videos here at the caveats, remember I'm simply describing experiences of folks within my world. I live in a very small world. So chances are what I'm going to talk about here may really have nothing to do with the, what you have lived through. And you're also welcome to share your different experiences and your points of disagreements in the comment section later on. So if you're going to throw any stones, uh, please pick the smaller stones. We can deal with that. So in this video, I'm going to describe the foundation of spiritual experiences that we typically are raised with in Kenya. Especially, this is important for those who don't live in Kenya and may not know much about our bringing. And I'll talk about how these foundations uh, shape the diaspora experiences. And then highlight some factors that I believe influence this specific trajectory. Now, towards the end, I'm going to talk about what really changes amongst returnees and offer a few explanations that I think probably uh, explain why we act the way we are when we come back. So let's begin with our dis discussion about uh, some of the foundation of our spiritual experiences. Number one, like I mentioned earlier, the vast majority of Kenyans living almost everywhere in Kenya are born and raised in hyper-religious communities. And... Uh, there's only a very small segment of Kenyans that are non-religious. In fact, in Kenya, I don't think I've ever met anybody who is non-religious. But I know there are folks who are really absolutely not religious at all. So the good news, though, is that there are many, 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 many good experiences that have been linked to these religious communities. I've seen folks really enjoy great sense of community, sense of belonging, a lot of emotional support, financial support, especially in times of need. And then there are also people who linked the boundaries that they've developed to religion. For example, I know people who don't drink alcohol because of religious teachings. So within religion, some folks have really established boundaries that tend to be helpful. And I'm not suggesting that uh, these boundaries exist only within religion. There are many, many people who are absolutely non-religious at all and develop just as good of healthy boundaries as those within religion. But yes, within religious communities, I've seen many, many kids and adults develop very healthy uh, uh, boundaries. And then in terms of resources, a lot of faith communities have built uh, schools, hospitals, and many other community uh, support structures that for years and years have been exceptionally beneficial. So I want you to remember as you listen to the other segment of this discussion that there's there are many, many good things about religion in Kenya even though so many things have also gone wrong and continue to go wrong. 
So in terms of uh, some of the things that I've observed that have not worked out well, especially within Kenya, number one, the most common one is exploitation of the vulnerable folks. I have seen religious leaders twist uh, religious texts to milk resources out of the most vulnerable members of the community while really enriching themselves. So I have never walked into a church where exploitation does not happen, especially financial exploitation, none of the churches that I've been to. And then, of course, lots of sexual misconduct that happened, uh, what we call chiniyamaji, happens in ways that uh, end up being covered up. Lots of sexual misconduct by people in authority. And then, of course, issues of discrimination, lots of classism. In the few Kenyan churches I've been to, sometimes you will be treated based on your class. Sometimes this treatment might be based on uh, a person's gender. Uh, there are churches where women are not allowed to do certain things, men are not allowed to do certain things, and religious texts are often used to uh, justify those different differential treatment. And of course, the other big uh, problem to do with tribalism, the exact same tribalism that we see outside church is very much alive within church, especially in city churches. I see quite a bit of that. And then, of course, disinformation. Uh, in the few churches that I've been into, there's a lot of people who are very ill-informed, that have very big microphones that stand out there and spread lots of conspiracy theories and misinformation around the clock. Because in many churches, there's, uh, there's no requirement that a person really verifies the data they share uh, with people. There. So there's a lot of disinformation that goes on in religious communities. And of course, another common one where People use uh, religious texts to justify all kinds of evil. And as we all know, uh, something such as slavery for decades and decades had always been justified using the Bible. A lot of that still happens today where we take religious texts and you slice them in ways that allows us to really justify all kinds of evil out there. Now, many of us uh, go through this in part because we were taught to follow religious teachings as is without question. Many of us are taught to revere religious leaders without question. And so anything that comes from a religious leader is often treated as truth without discussion. And unfortunately, this gives religious leaders unchecked power, power that they often use to harm people. And I'm so not saying all religious leaders. I'm not only talking about a segment of religious leaders who do this. And then, of course, we've been taught to think that religion is perfect. And what that means is that we often don't uh, uh, investigate uh, the human element that is inside of religion. Uh, anything that happens in religion is often treated as an act of God. We forget that there are lots of human involvement in what we put together under religion. And then, of course, as we talk about science, we often describe it as something that is at odds with religion. And... Connected to that, there are specific sanctions that are offered to people who go against the grain. I've seen people get excommunicated, forced kicked out of church, lose their jobs, lose privileges. In fact, I know a person in my life who lost a contract with a church simply because this person disagreed with a pastor. And so they decided to withdraw the contract this person had. And so there are specific sanctions for people who disagree with them. And so... When you think about uh, how these foundations end up shaping fo folks who move to diaspora, here are some things that you're likely to uh, encounter. Number one, many of us move in diaspora and are more likely to replicate the exact same things that we went through while in Kenya. Some of us, when we move to diaspora, have real trouble uh, connecting with or adjusting to people who are non-religious, especially atheists and Satanists and things like that. So in some ways, we often continue the same practices while there's a segment of us who walk in and sort of like go slow on these practices. I know people who go to churches less often, donate less often, and over time that becomes their new norm. While others actually have ended up even making more commitment to religious practices. Now there's a small segment of diaspora folks who actually simply end their commitment to religion. So they become completely non-religious. And this is a new posture has implications for when they return. Uh, and then there's also a small segment that simply adopt new practices. I've seen people switch from Christianity to Islam, people become atheists, uh, paganism, 
Or even more interestingly, I've seen people who do begin snake worshiping. If you don't know what that is, uh, look at what uh, some churches in West Virginia uh, does. So I've seen a few Kenyans that completely uh, switch into things that were very foreign to the Kenyan experience. Now, here are some of the factors that I think uh, influence this trajectory. That for one, when we move to diaspora, we move to communities that are less hyper-religious, in communities where uh, there's uh, limited family pressure to maintain the traditions that we grew up in. So your parents are not there to see if you're going to church or not. Your friends probably don't care. And then many folks in diaspora, of course, are often exposed to education, uh, higher education, which often comes with critical thinking. And sometimes critical thinking can be a problem for religious ways of doing things. Now, COVID also really changed a whole lot. And maybe we can talk about that in a future video. But the, the other more common, less uh, discussed topic is the issue of trauma recovery. When people move into diaspora, it often gives folks an opportunity to recover from all of the trauma they may have experienced in religious communities back in Kenya. And as they heal, their positions on matters religion really change. So uh, with all that, I would say that some of the common experience that you will notice amongst returnees is that when some of us come back, uh, we may remain exactly the same as we left, while many, many others come back completely non-religious. And many of us come back with zero commitment to religious teaching and question everything that uh, we do in church. And of course, a lot of folks come back and are unwilling to really uh, commit any resources, money to things that benefit religious leaders. And we become often very intolerant to some common practices like uh, churches that make noise around the neighborhood or exploitation in church. So if you are to ask me why this actually happens to returnees, here are some of the explanations. Number one, again, as I said earlier, I think uh, living in diaspora can give a person a chance to recover from trauma, abuse from the church, uh, sexual exploitation, and things like that. And many folks no longer believe in uh, some of the teachings we were raised with, no longer believe in life after death, no longer believe in superhuman experiences like miracles, curses, blessings, and things like that. A few others adopt completely different belief systems like animism, satanism, and all that stuff. And a good majority of us too, I think, for the folks that I know, often prioritize scientific thinking as opposed to religious doctrines. And of course, I'm assuming that uh, many of us adopt belief in equality, so we don't walk into church thinking that some people are better than others. And so these new belief systems can really change how we interact with religion when we come back home. And for a lot of us, religion no longer serves any purpose. So I hope this was informative enough. If it was, please subscribe. And I'll see you in the next. Thank you.